Hello and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk About and today we're talking about marketing which is one that I've uh, been looking forward to. Today we've got Stefan Drew with us. Uh, welcome Stefan. Um, Hi, much. Stefan is an author about market, on marketing and as well as starting a Facebook group and I think Stefan's been doing marketing for so long that uh, he's probably forgotten more than I know. So it's, it's wonderful to have him on today. So Stefan, let's jump straight into some questions here because I'm quite keen to get talking about marketing. And when I started my business, I totally underestimated what was involved in marketing. Um, is this a common trend amongst, uh, common trend amongst new business owners? Yeah, absolutely, Richard. Because, you know, let's face it, look at your position. You're an expert in spreadsheets. Why would you be an expert in marketing as well when you start? Of course, being in business, you have to then develop that expertise in marketing. But I wouldn't expect most people to have it from day one. Unless, of course, they're like myself, who started in marketing and had to market their own business. And believe in me, that was actually very hard for me because I was used to marketing a totally different sort of animal. And all of a sudden, I'm marketing my own business. It was hard for me as well, so I quite understand where people were coming from there. Yeah, I can, I can imagine this because it's obviously it's not the reason why you're starting your business. It's, it's much, it's, along the same lines of other things like tax returns and all those kind of things. You don't start your business to do that, but they, they end up creeping up on you. And I think marketing is one of those beasts. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I think one thing where I fell, where I fell well short is that I thought that marketing <laughs> was, was, was just a case of, um, I thought marketing was just a case of getting content out there. It was just a case of put something up and hope for the best kind of thing. But that's, that's, that's obviously not really what, what we ought to be doing. Um, I mean, it, it's a lot more than just getting content out, isn't it? Yes. I mean, a lot of people say to me, I've been marketing. And I say, well, show me what you've been doing. And they say, well, here are all the adverts I put out. And, you know, an advert is not marketing. An advert um, or a message, you know, and, and an advert is a message, basically. It's just a, a matter of saying, hi, here I am. Uh, this is what I've got. Um, it should say, and this is what you need to do to buy it. But often I find that those messages actually don't even say that. So if we're just putting content out, it does even less than advertising. So you and I might put content on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever, but that's just us saying something. Unless we take it further and say, and Richard, what do you think about what I've just been writing about? Or Richard, would you like to buy what I have now? This is how you do it then actually we're not marketing at all, we're just putting an advert in it. It's flying a flag, basically. Whereas what marketing is, 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 is far more intense than that. It starts off with us saying, well, what is it we want to sell? Who are our audience? And actually, do they want to buy what we want to sell? Because it's no good me trying to sell you something that you don't want. And if the rest of my audience don't want it, as good as I am at marketing, none of you are ever going to buy it. So I'm going to actually align my customer base, my potential audience, with what they want, not what I want to sell them. Then it's a matter of creating that product. And if you look at pure marketing, you'd start at the situation of identifying that audience, then identifying what product they want and reproduce that product. So within a marketing department, I worked in colleges for years and years and did a lot of education marketing. It's not enough for the curriculum area for the, for the experts to say, we want to teach this because it's up and coming. You go and market it. I'm going to go back to that audience and say, well, actually, do you know what this is? Do you want that? Or do you want something different? And if you want something different, I then going to feed that back to the expert to deliver that rather than what they want to deliver. Um, there's a different concept altogether. And then, of course, you go all the way through the process of letting people know what it is, getting them involved in it, getting them to buy it. It doesn't stop with buying them. It's the after sale that goes into it as well. Because the next customer is very likely to be an existing customer. I'll bet you, no, not, not too much money, because I don't bet too much money, but I, I don't mind betting that the last job you did was for a previous customer. Um, I can't actually remember what the last <coughs> job I did was. No, it wasn't. But what I will say is that I've monitored my mark, my um, where the business has come from in the last 12 months. And 60% of the business in the last 12 months has come from previous customers. Right, so that almost proved my fact. Usually I can say to people, 
your next customer will be your one of your previous customers. Mm -hmm. And 60, 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on the business, that will be right. Of course, if you're a new business, you haven't got any previous customers, yeah. so it doesn't then. But as you've become established, you we find that more and more people are, are, are previous customers. And that's why the after sales is so important. It's almost as important as anything else, in fact, more important than everything else, because you then need to keep in contact with those people, make sure that the product is up to the standard you said, that they've not got any questions, if they've got questions, you need to answer them. But you need to keep that dialogue going all the time. And that's where things like social media can come in, or indeed email. Um, and setting up an email group, or in my case, I've got a Facebook group, um, setting up some system whereby we can communicate on a, on a reasonable sort of basis or a really regular basis is really, really important to get those, those repeat sales. And of course, it's important for those people that are prospects but haven't yet become customers. So, because another mistake that I made when I was starting out was obviously <coughs> I, I knew absolutely nothing about marketing and, and everything I learned was from other businesses. So, what I would do was go on and see, okay, they're marketing like that. That seems like a good idea. Let's try that. And that, I mean, I had some absolutely horrendous failures early on in trying to copy, particularly um, B2C marketing when I was B2B business. Um, so it, this is obviously something that you, as you've, as you've touched on as a business owner, you need to sit down and think about what your objectives are, what you're trying to achieve, and what your client base wants. You, this isn't just something you can look at someone else and go, that seems like a good idea, let's try that. No, you have to align it with your type of business. So, for example, I see people say to me, you know, if you want to contact other business owners, there's only one way of doing it, you must be on LinkedIn. In my case, that's total rubbish. Okay, you and I linked on LinkedIn originally, I think, going back mm. some time ago. But most of my audience, the ones that I do most business with, aren't even on LinkedIn. I do business with the chief execs and principals of very large colleges in the UK. Um, I can count on the fingers of one hand, a number of those are active on LinkedIn. Most of them aren't. Some of them have got LinkedIn profiles but don't use them. Some I know, I know extremely well, I've actually deleted their LinkedIn profile. So if I followed the advice of all those people that said LinkedIn, then I would have done it totally wrong. No, I'm not saying LinkedIn is a bad thing, because you and I know it's actually a really good thing, and I know you do quite a lot of business on LinkedIn. But it doesn't mean to say that because you do it or someone else does it, I should do it as well. We've all got to look at where our audience is. Um, it's where your, your, your audience hang out, uh, as it were. And I did a little video on this some years ago of a woodpecker hanging out on, on some peanuts, uh, on a peanut feeder. Um, and I'll, I'll send you a link to that, and perhaps you can, you can share that with people. Because it's, it's a little bit humorous in a way, because it's just a video of a, of, a, of a woodpecker. But it talks about you have to hang out where your audience is. So if your audience are um, a particular age profile, you need to know about that. You need to know what gender they might be. Um, you need to know a lot about them. You need to profile them very carefully to begin with. And then part of that is to say, well, what social media do you use? In fact, do they use social media? Um, and you could say, well, if you're aiming at a much older audience, they're less likely to use social media. Um, not strictly true today, of course. And if you're aiming at a, a, a younger audience, they're actually less likely to use email on a regular basis. It's, it's not part of their lexicon at all. It's not in their DNA to use email. And it's interesting, I had a, a discussion yesterday with someone saying, well, how can you have an online uh, bank account and not have an email? I said, well, I can think of quite a few kids that actually use online banking but don't have email. Um, I mean, we imagine we know about everyone else because we know what we are like and think everyone else is the same as us. They're not. You have to sort of profile them like that for quite a long time to work out where they're going to be. And then you need to promote the business, uh, your content, your, your offers, etc., uh, etc., et where they are. And there's two types of advertising, or two types of marketing. There's intrusive marketing, which is when you cold calling would be a prime example. I had a cold call this morning. Someone phoned me and said, um, you registered yesterday for a trial on X, so when do you want to buy it? What, do you want the, the business or, or, the, or the, you know, the, 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 the semi-pro version? Mm. Actually, I found that very intrusive. I didn't want them to phone me. Not even trialed it yet. Um, whereas the other thing is, if you go on to Google and search for a question, how do I do X? A prime one for me was would be, what are the three different types of advertising? 
Now, I know for a fact that if you or anyone else goes out and does that search on Google, what are the three types of advertising, um, there's a very good chance that you'll find me on page one of Google. That's non intrusive That's where people have searched. They have actually had the intention. It's about intent. They have the intention of finding an answer to a question. Now, if I can get through search engine optimization, through search, uh, SEO, on page one of Google, when there are millions of people searching for that each year, then actually, that's good marketing. Provided that when they see the answer, they then think, hey, actually, I need this guy's help. Because just giving them the answer isn't going to solve anything for me, is it? It gives them the answer. It doesn't sell my product. So it's, it's quite a long, complex process there. We need to do a lot of things. We do, we do. But this also leads in, into my next question as well, because I think this is another trap that a lot of small businesses are, are fall into. And this is something which uh, almost every day I kind of think about. I think, why, why am I on so many social media channels? And because I think that the, the general trend is you need to be on Facebook, you need to be on LinkedIn, you need to be on Twitter, you need to be on Instagram, you need to be on here, you need to be on there to have a presence everywhere. And then you end up with eight different channels that all require slightly different um, posts. And then you, you, you generate a post and try and tweak it for each channel. And it just becomes a massive headache. I mean, that, that's obviously not true, is it, that you need to be everywhere? No, you can't. You, you just cannot do that. Because if you spend you know, an hour on LinkedIn, an hour on Facebook, an hour on Twitter, blah, 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 blah that would be eight hours a day gone on eight channels, wouldn't it? When would you do any work? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So you have to limit yourself. You have to limit it really to about five or six um, tactics, channels uh, that you can confidently use over a period of a week or so. You don't have to be there every day. Um, that I think is a is a fallacy as well. It's useful if you turn up every day, but you know you've got to run a business as well. So if you turn up on a regular basis, you know, twice a week, once a week, or even if you were doing email to people once a month, but if you always turn up on the fifteenth of the month they expect to see you on the 15th of the month, then that's regular. You don't have to do every day and every, every, you know, every hour of the day be being there. So choose five or six things that work for you. So let me give you an example there. You, you know that I do a lot on uh, a PR. Mm -hmm. PR is something that's natural to me. I enjoy PR, but more than enjoying it, it actually works. So public relations, I've put out uh, media releases to the, to the media when I've got a story to tell, um, but I'm also available for interview. And because I've been available for interview and I've been around for an awful long time, I get organisations like the BBC phone me on a regular basis, uh, and they'll say there's a breaking story this morning. Can you do an interview on this on the radio in 20 minutes' time? Sometimes time spans can be very, very short because breaking news is breaking news, and in two hours' time it's no longer news and they're not covering it. So I've made myself available there for them to, to be able to do that. Um, and you know that a couple of days ago I had a Daily Mirror. Uh, contact me uh, out of the blue and said to me, what would you tell Harry and Megan to do on social media? What advice would you give them? No, it wasn't Harry and Megan that told me. Let's, let's, let's be clear about that. The newspaper asked what I would say to them. But that gave me coverage in a national newspaper. And for me, that's very easy. Um, but what I don't want to do is we try to do lots and lots of other things as well. So I used to use email on a regular basis until I turned my business around and started doing something totally different. And I actually got rid of my email list. Now, I'm not advising anyone to do that. It's probably the worst thing most people can do. But I discovered that my audience weren't responding to email, but what they were responding to was the, with my PR, to the articles that I had a column in a sector magazine that was targeted at my audience. I wrote for every month, and the response rate I get from that is very good. It's much better than email. So why waste my time on email any longer? In that case, it wasn't working. I'm not saying I wouldn't send an email to an individual, but what I wasn't doing was sending out mass emailings, the regular sort of autoresponder type emailings. Because for me, that was no longer working. I'm not suggesting for a moment anyone follow that route because it would be what wouldn't work. And that's the thing. Don't follow what I'm doing. Evaluate what I'm saying and decide what might work for you rather than what works for me. Because probably isn't going to work for you. We've got different budgets. Have different experience, um, we've got different audiences and expertise, and, and what we like doing as well. 
Well, I think one one of the one of the rules that I kind of follow and that I offer people when I, when people ask me which platforms they should be on is my answer. And you can tell me whether this is right or wrong. But I normally say to them, look at two things. Look first of all, which platform? Where are your clients, your potential clients? And second of all, where where do you actually want to be? Because I think. For me, for example, I, I love LinkedIn. I love going onto LinkedIn. I love chatting with people and, and connecting <clears> with people. And I think I'm there to build relationships and, and, and engage on LinkedIn. I don't like Twitter. I, I don't like the platform. I don't want to go on the platform. So for me, I mean, I do a little, I still do a little bit of marketing on Twitter. But for me, I would advise myself to use LinkedIn because LinkedIn for me is where my clients hang out and LinkedIn for me is where I want to hang out. So I'm naturally there. So it doesn't feel like work while I'm on there. Whereas every time I go into Twitter, it does feel like work because I'm forcing myself to go on because it's, Oh, I have to go on for marketing. And that actually then becomes a bit of a pain. Yes, I, I understand that. And I'm almost the reverse of you. I use LinkedIn, and I was a great advocate of LinkedIn in the early days when it started. It's an incredible platform. I personally find it less useful now. I'm still there most days, um, but it's more to sort of engage with people and that, not so much for business in the strict sense of the word. But what I do find useful, personally, is Twitter. So we're the exact opposite, aren't we? Because what I find on Twitter is that, you know, I, I get told there's a lot of trolling on there, there's a lot of negativity on there and that. But I find that a lot of my audience are on there. So because I write for um, education media, uh, people like the Times Education Supplement, FE Week, FE New, uh, that now, um, the, the editors of those um, media are actually on there. They will post something on a regular basis. Here's the latest headline we've got. I'll go in there and make comments uh, on that. And I don't find that work. I just find that enjoyable. Um, but it works for me in the same way as it worked for you on LinkedIn. So different media, different platform. It's where your audience is. My audience is on Twitter, not on LinkedIn. Yeah, exactly. Well, now here's a question for you, Drew. Uh, uh, Stephen, sorry. Uh, what is the difference between marketing and advertising? Well, I've sort of touched on that as we've gone through already. Advertising is like putting a message out there. Let, let me just go into that because there are three types of advert. You can do the Coca-Cola, Nike type thing, McDonald's thing, where you advertise the brand. And if I go into, if I see Heinz beans or Heinz tomato ketchup advertised, and I go to the supermarket and I reach out for ketchup, I automatically reach for the one I've seen advertised last. That's the theory. It's not 100% true, but it tends to work. Um, at Christmas, Coke, Coca-Cola will advertise with their big red lorry coming to the store with Santa Claus. When you go off to the store to buy cola, you think Coca-Cola. That's the way it's meant to work. That will not work for you. That will not work for me. You're too small a brand. You could do it locally if you're just going to sell locally, and it might work to an extent, but most of us that won't work. Then there's direct sales advertising. Here's my product, buy it now, is really what it says. And you want an instant sale, whether they buy online by clicking onto an advert or, you know, jump in the car and go to your store to pick up something or whatever it might be, a phone you, whatever it might be, or, or even in some cases, subscribe to your newsletter. That's direct sales. And then there's something that you indicated earlier that you, you quite like, this relationship uh, building. And you can do that by not putting out what you might strictly think is an advert, um, because what you're doing when you're actually going on to LinkedIn and posting on there, it's a form of advertising. It's not the traditional form, of course, but it's a form of advertising. Then go back to what marketing is, and it's all those things I talked about earlier, deciding on the product, profiling your customers, doing all those sort of things and doing the after sales afterwards, and all the bit in between, all those thousands and thousands of different ways that you can market your business, that you can promote it, that you can advertise it, and um, believe you me, there are, there are thousands of ways. One of the tips I would give there when marketing is don't spend more money than you've got to. That, mm. that seems obvious, but I go to clients, very big clients, who have got multi-million pound budgets, and they can, they're, they're very likely often to blow most of that budget on one thing. So, for example, I went to a very large college in London some years ago to advise them on troubleshoot their marketing, basically, because they were in trouble. They were spending, spending over a million pounds a year. And they said to me, it's all right, no worries. We've got it cracked. We are going to get the whole side of an underground train, 
painted in our colours and with our messages on that. And that will solve all our problems. And I, mean, I, I couldn't help laughing a little bit, just to say the least. Because if you think of it now, how ridiculous, you're putting all your budget, or the majority of the budget, in one place. If people don't travel in the underground, then you're never going to catch them. Okay, most Londoners do travel in the underground sometimes. But to see the advert, the station has to be almost empty to see the train as it pulls in. And if it's a very busy platform, you can't see the advert anyway. And it's a bit like, if you're then busy getting on the train, you're not going to respond to that advert. If there's a telephone number, for example, on there, you're not going to scribble it down, are you, to come later. You, your, your business at that time is to get on the train. It's the same as advertising on the backs of buses. People say to me, wonderful thing to do. Well, so you put your telephone on the back of a bus, and the guy that's driving along behind it, the only person that can see this advert, them and their passenger, so 50% of them are too busy to actually respond to it because they're driving the car or a vehicle. It's not a great place to advertise. Advertising on the bus shelter might be better, uh, but not on the back of the bus. I'm not saying never advertise on the back of a bus, because I've done that as well. Um, but think about what you're trying to achieve with your marketing, mm. basically. Um, so if I go back to the colleges, for example, you and I know that if we went online and saw or saw anywhere an advert for a, a, a course, whether it's a low level or a degree level course, uh, the chances of us just picking up the phone and booking it there and there are nil. It's next to zero. What we might do, though, if someone said, come to an open day, then we might respond to that and go to the open day. But trying to sell the course isn't the answer. Selling the open day where you can get more information and meet individuals is a better answer. And when I worked in education, the one that worked for me best was not come and see it, come and try it. It's like a test drive on a car. Come and have a day in college as a student, or a half day maybe, but come in as our guest and trial the product. Now, most colleges don't do that, but where I've used it, the sign-up rate is really, really high because they've, they've come in, they've tried it, they've enjoyed it, and said, wow, that's what I want to do. For the few that didn't enjoy it, that was good news for us and them as well because they actually said, hey, I don't like this, I'm not going to do it. The first thing you could give them better advice on what they might want to do, but secondly, those people would probably have signed up if they hadn't tried it and left quite soon afterwards. They would have been a dissatisfied customer. And you know, a kid signs up for a course for, for one or two or three years and leaves after six weeks. That's not good news for anybody. We don't want that to happen. So sometimes dissuading a customer by letting them see the full extent of what your offer is, is good news. They don't waste your time or theirs. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And also I think that the whole thing that you, you were talking about, about not you know, the advertising on a bus is a, is a classic example of what we've been talking about earlier because if your if your intent with your marketing is to be a brand awareness, for example, like Coke, Coca Cola, and they for them to advertise on the back of a bus is fine because you just need to see the image go past. But if you're trying to sell something where you want people to go to your website or to phone you or whatever else the case might be, then advertising on the back of the bus isn't necessarily a good idea. So it just goes to show that you really have to think about what your what your objectives are with your marketing. Which, you know, that, will, that will then help you decide where you actually need to be marketing. Yes, and it's about what Google called micro moments, micro decisions. Don't take people from being a potential person interested in your product to buying immediately. Take them along a route where they take small steps. Small steps are less dangerous. Me suddenly saying, yes, I like this, this you know, 30,000 pound car you've got there, I will buy it from not knowing I want a car a few moments ago, it just isn't going to happen. But if you say to me, look, come and have a look at it. Uh, do you want a test drive? Do you want to, do you want to hire it for the weekend? Whatever it might be, let me make those small steps because actually coming for a test drive isn't threatening to me. It isn't committing. It's just demonstrating to me what you've got and letting me enjoy it. Like my taste courses in colleges, coming in and enjoying it. But it's a small step to take, whereas Buying the car from not knowing I wanted a car a few moments ago to buy a new one, just like that, just isn't going to happen. So little tiny steps towards the objective. Don't expect people to do everything up, which is why getting people to sign up to your newsletter, it's a terrible term, newsletter, but for want of a better word, getting them to sign up to your, your newsletter is actually very easy relative to selling your product straight away. Because in the newsletter, you can give them more content. There's another point I'd like to make there. You said earlier about posting on to Twitter being 
uh, like hard work. Mm -hmm. But say you were to write a good post on your website, on your blog, and instead of actually writing on Twitter uh, your message, you just say, here's something you didn't know about spreadsheets, and you send them then to that page on your website where you can have more space, because Twitter doesn't give you much space, you know, 120 characters, doesn't give you much argument over. So that might be another way of doing it. Another way I like very much, I, I use a lot, is video. Um, there are some very incredibly good video systems out there these days. People used to think to, to run a video, an advertising video, you had to first of all sit in front of a camera and say something, or at least give it a voiceover. But I use a system that then, I'll, again, I'll send you a link to, to some of the videos I've produced, um, where I write a message, and it might be 10, 20, 30 sentences, that message. It can be as long or as short as you want. I then put it into a piece of software, and it uses AI then to generate a video. When you think about that, the, the automation generates a video, not me. Uh, I then go in and edit it, and sometimes I don't like it at all and start from scratch. But 9 out of 10, that video is pretty well there, because AI today is very, very powerful in video making. I can produce a video very often in an hour, two or three hours at most. Um, uh, I'll, say, I'll give you a link that you can post with this, and then we can, people can see that, and if they want more information, they can, then they can ask more. Well, let's talk about uh, analytics of marketing, because as you know, I made that, uh, I got fed up with doing marketing, not knowing how successful it was. And I made that spreadsheet to monitor all the marketing that I'd done. And, and then it take, took the analytics from the various platforms and from Google um, analytics to report back to me as to what was more successful. And it's, it's been a huge eye opener for me. I mean, a lot of it's told me what I, what I assumed, but I've learned some, some other things about my marketing as well. How important is it actually to retrospectively go and analyze uh, what's happened from your marketing um, in, in the whole in the whole process? It's absolutely vital because why continue doing it if you don't know it's working? I wrote a book years ago on advertising, um, and the first piece of advice I gave in that book is: if it isn't working, stop it. And if you don't know if it's working, stop it. <laughs> because most of us would put an advert out there, particularly in the old days when when it was all print advertising. You put an advert out there, how did you measure it at work? Someone phoned you. How did you know that that phone call came from that advert? People would say, we asked them, uh, or we surveyed them. Well, actually, that's probably not enough, because people say things without understanding the question sometimes. Did you see us in the newspaper? You think, yeah, I saw, I saw something. Yeah, I saw Stephen in the Daily Mirror yesterday. Um, so that must be the answer, must be yes. But that wasn't a response to my advert. The advert hadn't worked. Um, not what I did advertise, but, but it's that principle. Today, what we can do is we can get um, digital analytics. So if I put an advert on Facebook, and the Facebook um, uh, process there then produces my analytics for me, it tells me which advert worked, which advert didn't work, it gives me all the detail of what did and didn't work. Same with Google Ads, um, all the sort of digital stuff like that. And if you were going to then still, say, use newspaper advertising, because it still works, believe it or not, um, then what I would do there to be able to measure it is I wouldn't use my standard telephone number. At worst, I would go out and buy a um, cheap mobile phone where the number was only advertised on that one advert, so that every call that came in must have come from that one advert. No one else has the number. And of course, I could recycle that phone in, in, you know, if I ran an advert in six months' time. And the chances are no one's still responding to the old advert and then responding to the second advert. But you need to do that. Plus, if I'm running adverts or whatever other marketing tactic I'm using, I like to split test. So by split testing, I mean you run several different versions of that advert um, to see which one works. Because what you and I think will work and what does work is not always the same thing. You know, if you're really good at marketing, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. Intuitively, I sort of know what won't work. I think I know what will work. Even then, I'm often proved wrong. I'm like nine out of 10. Well, nine out of 10 isn't good enough. You know, I want 10 out of 10. So by testing it, so let me give you an example there of real life. Mm -hmm. I did some work for a very large environmental charity some years ago. 
where they wanted to advertise their uh, venue for conferencing. It's a wonderful venue. In fact, they have eight or nine venues around the country. They all overlook great big nature reserves. You can sit in their conference rooms and see wild geese and ducks and that flying around. It's wonderful. A bit distracting from the conference, but wonderful view. And they said to me, well, we know why people come to, to, to our venues, but we're not getting enough. They come because we're a wildlife charity and people can see the wildlife. And I thought, well, is that true? That's, that's what they want to believe. So what we did was we ran some adverts and we spit tested them. Each advert was the same first line, the same second line, but the third line was totally different in each advert. This was on Google Ads. And the third line said things like, overlooking a wonderful nature preserve. The second one would say things like, um, close to the M5. The next one would say, catered for three to 300 people. We put lots of different sort of sub-messages in there. Mm. Google then ran that for us as a campaign and each person saw a different version. So if there were 10 versions, about 10% of the market saw one advert, 10% saw the second advert, blah, blah. When we got the results back, we could tell which advert had been clicked on most. And believe it or not, it wasn't the one that said overlooking a wonderful nature reserve, <laughs> which is what they wanted. It was actually the one that said catering for three to 300 people. Because um, the people that were searching for the venue were often the chief executive PA or uh, the conference organiser or whatever, they weren't interested in wildlife. They were interested in their event and having a good venue that would cater with what they wanted. So we had to think about it from their point of view, not from my, my client's point of view. And that's split testing, which is really important. It, it is, yes. Uh, one last question, if I may. Um, what are the advantages? Obviously, we've heard a lot about it from you today, but the obviously advantages to getting someone on board to do your marketing rather than doing it yourself, specifically the external view of, of things. But at what point, I mean, does it just come down to budget? At what point do you actually consider getting a, a, a marketing professional on board rather than doing your own marketing? It's a complex question, that one. I mean, you would expect to say, well, you must have someone like me on board because we know all the answers. We don't know. We know a lot of the questions. You often know the answers. We know the questions. And often it's a matter of asking the right questions. The problem with doing our own marketing, as I indicated earlier, I wasn't actually very good at marketing my own business when I started. I was actually too close to it myself. By getting someone from outside, they don't assume anything. And that's why I go into large organizations and troubleshoot the marketing. They are so close to it that they don't ask the obvious questions. Um, an expert can come in and ask obvious questions. The warning I would give here is, Get what you want, and let's look at it in medical terms. You want a GP to assess your total health as opposed to a consultant. Um, if I've got stomach ache, I don't want to go and see the ear, nose, and throat uh, consultant in the local hospital. I actually want to see the, cons uh, the, the, the GP to begin with to send me to the right consultant. Mm. There's a bit of that with marketing. You want a big overview to begin with, a helicopter view of you and your business and what you should be doing. Um, you then later might be, it might be a good idea then to go to the specialized expert, and that may not be the person you saw to begin with. So, you know, if I said to people, right, actually, one thing I have to determine is you need to measure your analytics, and for that, you need a spreadsheet. And actually, you don't need me for a spreadsheet, you need to go to my mate Richard. But that's the way I would say you go to the right consultant at the right time. So, yes, I think a marketing professional can help. Make sure it's the right person and we've got the right experience. But to begin with, do something like test what I run at the moment, my Facebook group, where I give away free marketing ad, uh, marketing advice, where I post information and people can post questions, um, and just get a, 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 an understanding of what marketing is all about before appointing someone. Because every marketing person is going to say they're the best person to have. Mm. Well, they would, wouldn't they? <laughs> you know? um, get a bit of background knowledge yourself. And even when you actually then employ someone to do something, you still need, I think, if possible, to get a little bit of knowledge yourself so you can ask the right question and actually advise them correctly. So if you're designing, you want a website, you just don't go to a web designer and say, I want a beautiful website that sells stuff. You have to give them a little bit more information on that because they will produce a beautiful website that sells stuff. But actually, well, it might be beautiful, but will it sell stuff? Um, 
they're used to doing what they're used to doing. They're experts in their own field. What they're not expert in is your audience, your business, and all the rest of it. So you need to look around and think, well, what do I want this website to do? What's my objective to begin with? Is it to sell stuff, or is it to get people to subscribe to my newsletter? To my newsletter as a step of this micro-intent, this micro-steps in my marketing process. So you have to tell the designer what it is you need. You, you actually have to write uh, quite a detailed inf uh, information sheet on what you want them to do. And when I've worked in colleges, I've actually split, sit down and written these um, RFPs, we call them, where I've given great detail to a designer on the, on the sort of thing that we want on the website. And on a small website, I'll find a few sites A4. When I've done them for colleges, they can be 80 or 90 pages of A4, that detailed. Mm. So you need to know enough to be able to say that. You don't need to know what technology to use. I can just say, I want it to do X, Y, or Z. I want it to gather um, details of people that come to my website. Um, you can then leave the designer to maybe to sort of decide which app or which plugin to use on your website. That will do that best. You don't need total knowledge, but you need to know what you want it to do. Exactly. Well, Stephen, thank you very much. I mean, I've, I've recommended a few people join your Facebook group because I found it tremendously uh, helpful and I will continue to do so. But thank you very much for coming to have a chat with us today. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I hope, do hope that this has been useful to everyone who's watched it. Um, and uh, yeah, Stephen, thanks again. Thank you, Richard. I've really enjoyed it.